Have you ever wondered why we care so much about our rank in games? From complicated MMR systems and games like Valorant to the leaderboards in the arcades of our childhood, gamers have always loved the feeling of climbing the ladder. The sense of accomplishment that comes with your score going up is huge, especially when you know you're playing against real people. And yet, sometimes playing ranked infuriates us or fills us with dread, especially when we expect more from our teammates or even ourselves. So why do we care? Let's dig deeper. People have different reasons for getting pulled into a game. Sometimes this is as simple as just enjoying the gameplay a lot, and there's definitely an addictive feel to popping heads in fast-paced games like Call of Duty. It might not be as adrenaline-inducing as going on a roller coaster, but pulling off quick scopes gives you a thrill that's easily experienced in the relative safety of your home. But it's rare for people to immediately warm up to a game. Not only are quick scopes difficult to pull off when you're new, it's also harder to be invested in a game when you're just starting out. Game developers realized this a long time ago, which is why they've been adding enticing features on the side for decades. Leaderboard Boards were the first thing displayed on most arcade games, with each entry being a score and three characters which told everyone who they were. This simple feature was actually a brilliant way to entice people to try out the game. On one hand, you have the crowd going, this guy's at the top, I bet I could do better than that. On the other hand, you have people thinking, I wonder how hard it is to break into the top 10. All the scores seem very similar. A leaderboard brought out curiosity in people because it connected the game experience with a social outer world. Even if you haven't talked to anyone, getting first place meant everyone who played the game would know who you are. While the social aspect of it was important, there was another hidden incentive within leaderboards. Each time you played the game, you'd find out how much you scored at the end. This meant that no matter how well you objectively did, you could compare how well you did on your first game with how well you did on your fifth game. The steady growth in scores and success made you feel accomplished, and even if you're not competing with the top players yet, it makes you feel like you can get there with some determination. Moving on from leaderboards, it's clear that sometimes we play games for standing. Sometimes when we play out of ego, like when we want to beat that bragging douche at the top, we're still unconsciously playing for approval. It's hard to accept that someone we don't like is better, so we decide to prove to ourselves that it can't be true. We tell ourselves, I don't care about this game, but he does, and I bet I'll be better at it than him anyway. And out of such shallow motivations, usually referred to as introjected motivations, a real love for the game is born. Introjected motivation can come from internalized guilt around a negative interaction or receiving consistent negative feedback without positive reinforcement, and this isn't limited to just gaming. An example of this is someone who spends a lot of time practicing a sport because they feel like if they don't play well, they'll let their team down or that other people will look down on them. Over time, we slowly develop a connection to the mechanics and progression system of a game, and in the case of many multiplayer games today, even the community. This way, the game itself and the separate scoring system form a loop that makes sure that the more invested you are in the game and its mechanics, the higher your score goes, constantly feeding your sense of accomplishment. Multiplayer games have made sure to capitalize on this because eventually, you'll get invested enough that the game will feel like it's a part of your routine. But scoring systems aren't unique to games, they've been in education and sports for centuries, and the recent trend of of gamification has introduced things like RPG leveling systems, which are still scores to mundane tasks to make things more fun. The difference between scoring systems in games and other fields is that games figured out that numbers and ranks can feel rewarding. The ELO system created by Arped ELO, who was a master level chess player, was first adopted in 1970 by the World Chess Federation. It was devised to be a more statistically sounding ranking system for chess players at the time, since prior to this, players were ranked using the Harkness system, which ranked players purely based off players' individual wins, losses, and draws. I'm not going to bore you guys with the math involved with the ELO rating, but if you're interested, I linked it in the description. The main point here is that this was a revolutionary self-correcting ranking system that changed how we judge players and competitive endeavors even to this day. Systems like the ELO rating were used in chess mainly to figure out who would win and to matchmake people of similar levels. Multiplayer games have used scores to matchmake people too, all the way back since Halo 2 was first released on Xbox Live, but tracking player success was still a higher priority. The true skill ranking system developed for Halo 3 was an incredibly complex calculation that boiled down to 50 levels in the end so players could easily tell their friends that they were the best, and it worked perfectly. Contrary to what the boomers might tell you, games are actually very good for your psyche and intellect. When you play games such as League of Legends or Overwatch, you are continuously developing your teamwork skills by trying to understand what your teammates need to win, you're practicing your visual memory by remembering the layout of the maps you're playing on, and you're honing your reflexes and focus. Anyone who's played Tracer in Overwatch and try to get good at tracking with their pistols while time traveling around will know how how hard the mind works to manage everything at the same time. The real danger is when we stop enjoying the game and just keep getting better because we either sink into the sunk cost fallacy or we start experiencing ladder anxiety. If you've ever been
been on a losing streak and gotten so frustrated that you had to keep playing until you at least got back to where you started, that's the sunken cost fallacy at work. And when this happens, we can't stop thinking that we've put so much time into the game and yet ruined our rank in such a short amount of time. The added pressure piles up every match and it ends up making us play worse and sometimes even rage at our teammates. And just on the other side of this is ladder anxiety. We all work hard for our ranks, grinding our way through matches for weeks or months, and when we finally get to our goal, we're afraid of losing it by just having a bad match. This is ladder anxiety. We're afraid we'll get bad teammates, we're afraid the enemy will play something that counters us completely, we're afraid we might even just have a bad day. Sometimes the anxiety doesn't even start from a losing streak, and yet when our fears get validated for even a single match, the fear gets stronger until we cool down, which for some players might simply be the next day, or for others until the next rank reset at the end of the act or season. This anxiety is especially present in games where a rank is tied to a cosmetic reward like Heroes of the Storm. It sucks, because it's never limited to just gaming. A lot of people are afraid of disappointing others or themselves, whether it's because of something that was their fault or not. Once we come to terms with ourselves, gaming becomes a lot more enjoyable. Let's take a look at some of the most popular games and their ranking systems. Counter-Strike Global Offensive has been around for a decade and its ranking system has been refined quite a bit over the years. You start from a measly silver one, going up the ladder through ranks like Distinguished Master Guardian all the way to Global Elite. When you look at the amount of players in each rank, less than 1% of the player base are in Global Elite. When you get to to that level, you know that you're the best. The same goes for high immortal and radiant players in Valorant. Whenever anyone sees you in game and searches up your profile, your name is the least relevant part. They'll look at your guns, cosmetics, and whether you're using your main in the match that you're playing in. Telling your friends that you're global elite, however, make sure that they know that you're good enough to take control of a match and have those scenarios play out. It's a big ego boost and status boost. Another reason why players spend thousands of hours of their lives grinding to get to the top is because of the feel-good chemical dopamine that is released in the reward system portion of our brain when we do something good like win around, get a kill, or gain elo. So if you think about it, we have the sunk cost fallacy and ladder anxiety causing us to run away from our losses, stacked with huge spikes of dopamine rewarding our brains each time we get a kill, win a match, climb the ranks, and pulling us closer to our goal. This combination of something that you are running away from and something that is pulling you closer to your goals that we see being used in ranking systems is an extremely powerful combination that famous entrepreneur and author Alex Hermosi also talks about when examining examining the traits of highly successful people. If you've ever played a battle royale game, chances are you've stumbled upon debates about skill-based matchmaking, sometimes referred to as SBMM. Even though pitting players against others of equal skill has been a thing in most multiplayer games of every genre, including League of Legends, StarCraft II, and Gears of War, many gamers are craving for a playground with more diverse opponents. Big streamers like Ninja in particular have thrown tantrums over skill-based matchmaking because they went from being the stars of their matches to simply average. To a lot of people, not being able to flex their rank and skill directly ruins the point of playing even if the alternative comes at the expense of someone else's enjoyment. Surprisingly, they aren't the only ones against skill-based matchmaking. Many players of strategy, racing, and even battle royale games like Fortnite are also against skill-based matchmaking because they see unfair matchmaking as an opportunity to rank up against low elo players. In a game like Forza where each corner is a shortcut waiting to be used, watching and learning from the pros while you get beaten can still help you improve. Even pro players sometimes have to learn from newbies because when you spend so much time playing a game and learning a meta, a fresh perspective can change everything. Overall though, skill-based matchmaking has a lot of players who aren't tournament level to enjoy the game at their own pace and not suffer through the monotony of losing. Call of Duty got caught in the crossfire though. The 17th installment of the franchise, Black Ops Cold War, was consumed in the skill-based matchmaking debate before release. Shooters were one of the first genres to incorporate matchmaking based on a player's rank, and the Call of Duty franchise had always had skill-based matchmaking all the way back since the first Modern Warfare, which introduced matchmaking itself to the franchise for the first time. Many players thought that skill-based matchmaking was a new thing in Call of Duty and had no idea the system had been favoring them this whole time. The actual crime of Black Ops Cold War was that they brought back the reworked skill-based matchmaking from the Modern Warfare reboot, which was almost universally disliked. The complexity of ranking systems today has made newer games feel off for longtime fans. Players in older Call of Duty games were mostly rewarded for kills and kill-death ratio, and this was the main factor in getting a decent rank. Games have started tracking much more than that these days, and games like Valorant don't just 
just use your wins and losses to determine your rank, but also your behavior and encounters. Valorant tries to judge whether you used your ability to save yourself in a fight you couldn't win, whether you blocked your teammate from getting a kill, whether you intentionally picked a fight alone, and many other small details. Part of this is to separate player skill from an unlucky batch of teammates, but another part is to make sure players feel rewarded even when indirectly showing their teamwork and skill, like when they throw a well-placed flashbang. Call of Duty has been slowly nudging in this direction as well, increasing score even for minor support acts. Considering support characters have been essential in games like Dota and World of Warcraft, it makes sense to let players bring their own style and enjoy the game in their own way. But as always, it's important for that to be balanced with rewarding the pros who've played the game for years and can rack in dozens of kills per match regularly. Just remember that no matter what you play, how you play, or how long it takes you, you should be proud of your rank. Games have been perfecting ranking systems because they're meant to make us feel good and stay hooked on our favorite titles. Just don't boost and pay to win because that sucks. I hope you enjoyed this video on the psychology of ranks in ELO and how developers make them so fun for us to play. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel since it helps me out as a college student who's passionate about the gaming industry and so you can see my next video that is right around the corner.